All right, this is Kurt Rorty speaking. I am back. Uh, my clock may be different from yours, but I show about 1.45 p.m. New York time. Uh, a statement from the uh, Federal, uh, from the FOMC, specifically the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank. That statement due out in about 15 minutes. And I find if I uh, don't get started talking soon that I uh, run short of time and all my preparatory discussion before the uh, Fed decision. So uh, in case you're wondering about where, where you're at and uh, why you're here, we are here to cover this so-called Fed decision. The uh, representatives from the Federal Reserve, specifically the members of the Federal Open Market Committee, or FOMC, have a meeting uh, met yesterday and uh, at least the first half of today to discuss uh, uh, monetary policy. And we'll find out uh, what their statement uh, has to say within the next 15 minutes, actually specifically at the top of the hour. Until then, we'll talk about uh, what one might expect uh price action, uh, commentary from the Fed, all that stuff. But first of all, let me uh, thank each one of you for attending today. What I was uh, getting at was that um, uh, the dollar did, uh, made some gains following the release of the earlier uh, EDP and GDP reports, but uh, surrendered those gains. So the euro, back where it was uh, earlier this week, back where it was on Monday. Uh, and so i got eight minutes left for the Fed decision. Uh, I was going to show you a graphic here. Uh, one reason why, let me highlight this back on the, uh, on the Euro chart. You're seeing a, a one hour chart for the Euro here. Perhaps one reason why the dollar gained initially, the, the, the initial gain of the dollar against the Euro and the dollar gain against other currencies as well. The initial gain of the dollar against the Euro following the release of the earlier ADP and GDP reports, uh, those, th- that gain might have been a race in part because, uh, um, what's you know, the focal point for the day? Arguably, the Fed decision. The Fed decision. Maybe there's some market fears, market concerns. The Fed's not going to uh, sound or look quite as dovish as what some would like or some would think. Well, and one reason for that, yeah, that's a possible. Now, let me show you why. Let me show you why uh, that that could be a, uh, an issue or could be a, a driver behind the lack of fall through uh, in response to ADP and um, GDP reports. One thing reported, which doesn't always make the major headlines from the GDP report, but it is something that the, uh, several market watchers, several market players, and the Fed themselves pay close attention to, that's the uh, price indexes, specifically the PCE, or Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Indexes. And here's a graphic showing a couple of those indexes from the uh, GDP report released earlier today during the uh, New York morning trading session. You see two lines in this graphic. Uh, The gray line represents the standard PCE price index. Again, it stands for personal consumption expenditures. Uh, The blue line represents the core PCE price index. That excludes the the, the prices for things like food and energy. Now, these figures, um, another measure of of, uh, of, of price inflation is, uh, you know, the the CPI report, which we get once a month as well. But uh, this is the measure I'm going to highlight here now, the core PC price index. This is something the Fed pays close attention to. In fact, it's it's reportedly, this is reportedly the Fed's preferred measure of U.S. inflation. And the point I want to make was not not, not so much the – Today's data point itself, which was just north of one percent, but look at the recent trend. Now, what what do these lines mean? Well, these lines show the year over year percent change in overall PCE prices, or the prices that were uh, that are defined as you know by personal consumption expenditures by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which compiles that uh, GDP report. So, you know, what what these lines going down mean over the past uh, year or so? It means that prices are still rising year over year, but not as not as rapidly, not as quickly. Now, what does this mean to Fed policy? The fact that prices are not rising as as uh, greatly as what they were about a year ago. Well, it, you know, it means that uh, you know one of the factors that the Fed was looking closely at to help them make a decision of you know do they when lift do they scale back on their quant- so called quantitative easing program. Does anyone recall the two things the Fed was looking? Uh, uh, the Fed has um, so-called threshold criteria for um, their QE or uh, quantitative easing program. Two things. There's two things. Yeah, Josh has it. Inflation and jobs. Inflation and jobs. Well, yeah, we got a Josh report again. The ADP report came out earlier today, but there's 
that ADP report is, has a uh, questionable correlation at best with the, the non-farm pairs report. And we'll get the next non- NFP number on um on Friday. So that's, we have yet to see the latest jobs picture, the latest reasonably accurate read of the jobs picture. Well, uh, and, and the specific, uh, specific to jobs, the Fed has called out for what is it, that six and a half percent unemployment rate? Well, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, another thing the Fed has called for in terms of the threshold guidance, you know, a, a level that they would see as, uh, a meaningful sign that the U.S. economic recovery is in full swing is, um, two and a half percent inflation. Well, we're not there yet. Well, we're, we're, uh, on a year-over-year year percent change basis, we're around uh, just north of 1%. So we, you know, we're quite a ways. Not only are we quite a ways away from uh, something near 2% inflation, but um, the, the, the trend of the inflation numbers, again, the year-over-year year change in prices, is not going in the direction the Fed would like to see. Again, prices are still rising, but they're not rising as quickly as they were you know, several months or a year ago. So what does this mean? This would suggest, if anything, that the Fed's not going to uh, not going to be, look sound or, or appear as eager to taper their bond buying program. And if if, if the statement uh, could do out in about three minutes confirms that, if the, if the statement looks uh, maybe a little less hawkish or perhaps even a little more dovish than the market thinks, that could uh, spark some dollar weakness here. So there is some risk of dollar weakness, if only because of these. Uh, uh, inflation figures from the GDP report released earlier today. But having said that, uh, again, uh, what the Fed may, uh, what the Fed's going to say in a statement may have, you know, little to no bearing on what the uh, GDP report uh, showed earlier today. But you know, they, you know, the, the Fed saw those numbers and saw those uh, prices and was, was was certainly going to, um, you know, you consider that that information as part of their discussions. And their, their decision in terms of whether it's they say in their statements. So, uh, we'll, uh, stay tuned here for the Fed decision, the statement due out in, uh, less than a couple minutes now. Oh, the thing I was going to mention earlier, which, uh, I got sidetracked before we had the uh, sound issue, uh, whipsaw. This is a time of day we can see, uh, some significant whipsaw type price action. A so-called unidirectional move, you know, straight up on the euro or sharply down on the euro. That may or may not happen, depending on the nature of the um, uh, of the content, specifically of the statement that's uh, due out. So here's what we're going to do: we're going to sit back and uh, see what the statement has to say. If you see for any reaction, there could be a sort of a new scalp play. It would certainly be a risky one. It's not, 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 not highly recommended if you uh, haven't uh, scalped news before. But uh, you know, one possibility. And this is an hourly chart. I would go to a five minute chart. One possibility is we get something like. Uh, Maybe it's a rise up, pull back, extension. That we would monitor that on a one minute or five minute chart. You know, that something like that's a possibility. Looking for a dip after initial rise. It's, well, of course, you, especially uh, if you're looking to take that at all, you might consider taking that if we if we, we hear uh, news about um, some sort of uh, uh, you know dovish hints in the Fed statement. So we're waiting for, waiting for the Fed right now. Thank you, Mohammed, for the time update. Mohammed says 40 seconds, probably more like 30 or 25 right now. So I'm going to be silent here for a moment, and uh, we're going to wait for the wait for the Fed statement. I'm on that already chart for the year. I'm going to switch that to a five-minute chart. I'm going to make all these five minutes. See the euro on the upper left, K1 upper right, Aussie on lower left. That could change the cap. I'm going to leave it on Aussie. And then we'll look at the dollar cat as, or dollar, sorry, dollar yen as well. You see a uh, some weakness in the dollar. I turned off my TV, so I don't have any any news from that perspective. I just I just lost trade the news. My uh, news service. Let me get that back going again. You're some thirty pips, actually more like forty pips from its previous news level. No, uh, by, by the way, we call this a, a rate decision. This this event's typically called a rate decision, but uh, it, 
the so-called uh, uh, interest rate, the benchmark interest rate by the, set by the Fed, the Fed funds rate, not changed at all. I was no surprise. So no change in the, at the Fed funds rate. Uh, they've they've uh, kept uh, the, the prior decision intact. And the many, that is a, a leap in the Fed funds rate in a range between 0.25%. Uh, ooh, the first statement I see, uh, that they, there's a reference to inflation remains persistently below 2% objective and poses a risk. So there you go. Remember, we, we talked about the, uh, uh, the trend of, uh, inflation or more specifically disinflation as shown from the, uh, um, GDP report, report released earlier today. And it looks like the first thing the Fed has mentioned in their statement or the first, at least the first thing that news has highlighted from the Fed statement was uh, inflation being persistently below the 2% objective, and as we said earlier, if the market uh, uh, got a hint of something like that from the Fed state, that we might see some dollar weakness, and so far we got that. This platform is even lagging as well. I can tell from the price action. It's not... Uh, not real time, but um, and we're close. See, you got the uh, you got the rise in the euro there. I'm highlighting a one minute candle now. You see the euro rise of about uh, what was it, uh, 30, 40 pips. Pull back here, a little drop, almost a 50 a drop of 50 percent from the original uh, rise up. Now the question is, can it extend further? Well, now, now having said that, there may be yet another dip to be had if you're looking to buy. A pair like the euro on a dip. And if you're going to trade, uh, by the way, this, this could totally be spectator sport for almost all of you here. There's nothing saying you had to trade this event. Yeah, euro kind of sold out after that initial, uh, initial rise. I'm backing out the four-hour chart to see where we are relative to a historical price action. If you look at the uh, price action this, this far this week, the euro has uh, definitely shown a tendency to top out around uh, 133, the psychological level. You know, given that, it's, it's not crazy to wait for a drop. If you're, you're going to trade us at all, not crazy to wait for a drop down to and a stall in price action closer to 1.33, which, again, was previously resistance uh up until about this, uh, really the past uh, two or three days this week. Another option, if you're going to look in the trade of all, is you know wait for a um, uh, wait for a higher high, and then look for a pullback. Again, we've gotten the, the, the initial so-called knee-jerk reaction to the news. Let's see if this is going to extend for. So I'm going to back out even further. Hmm. Let's see what we got. Yeah, 133 has been has certainly been an issue before. And probably what I, what I do as well is uh, here we are back at 133. Be careful here. Again, whipsaw, a whipsaw type price action, real possibility. In other words, let me face this chart to illustrate what I mean by that. The euro's gone up. The euro's gone down. This is an hourly chart. The euro could totally continue uh Back down if either if the market grabs something from the FOMC statement that it had noticed before, or like, like I said, just because of the time of day, because of a, a, the the lack of uh, traders in the market right now, uh, you can see some type of a zigzaggy type price action uh, unfold before uh, e even if there's something that's so incredibly double or so incredibly uh, uh, hawkish from any given Fed statement, uh, that kind of zips that. Uh, zigzag type price action, a real possibility here. I'm going to take a moment here to take a close look at that statement, see what, um, see what it has to say. Hardy mentioned the deflation issue. Let me post that in the room. FOMC says inflation. I'm summarizing from a post by Trader News. Inflation remains persistently below 2% objective. You could also, for anyone who uh, wishes to play at home, you could also go to the, to the Fed's website, federalreserve.gov, which actually I'm going to do right now, and uh, look, look at the statement there. Because at the moment I'm relying on news service to uh, give me highlights, but I kind of rather just... Uh, 
go to the source and let's, let's get in the statement. And here we are, the dollar's back, at least against the euro. Well, I guess it really gets the cable, I guess the British pound as well. Dollar pretty much back where it was. Pre news. And I'm, again, I'm showing an hourly chart in the upper left. But you can, I point out, the reason I'm showing these other charts, you can see the dollar is, um, uh, is reestablishing itself like that's multiple major currencies, not just the euro. Brief jump against the Aussie, but then uh, they thought sorry, the dollar lost uh, lost ground against the Aussie. Now the Aussie's making uh, uh, new lows here, new post news lows. Dollar yen dropped briefly, and the dollar yen backed up to where it was pre news. Skimming the Fed statement right now. They refer to labor market conditions showing improvement. Economic growth will pick up from its recent pace. Yeah, and at the end of the second paragraph, if you happen to be looking at the Fed statement uh, on your own from the at federalreserve.gov, the last sentence of the second paragraph of the statement refers to the uh, uh, inflation comment that we referenced earlier there. The committee recognized that inflation persistently below its 2% objective could pose risks to economic performance. <laughs> but they anticipate that inflation will move back toward its objective over the medium term. So, uh, Good luck with that, guys. The committee decided to continue with purchasing additional agency mortgage-backed securities. So the um, and this is, by the way, it's no surprise that, that the Fed decided to to maintain, for now at least, their pace of asset purchases. The um, uh, the meeting that's uh, likely to attract the most attention with regards to the potential a uh, potential tapering of of uh, bond purchases that would be the September meeting. That would be the September meeting. Would be a uh, uh, lot of folks not meeting in terms of potential for the Fed tapering or, or scaling back its bond purchases, scaling back its quantitative easing program. Which, uh, to the degree between now and then, that um, the market perceives the Federal Reserve is getting closer to some sort of tapering move, some closer to some sort of scaling back of its bond purchases. To, to the degree that the market perceives the Fed's going to scale back. That should benefit the dollar. Now, if, if the market uh, proceeds otherwise, if there maybe this um, the idea of, skin, of tape rain is, uh, is it's, it's, it's too early. The Fed's uh, if the market proceeds, the Fed's not prepared to do so based on the economic data uh, between now and, and the September meeting. Then, um, you know, we can see the dollar give up at some of its uh, recent gains against multiple major currencies, and so that would mean up for the euro USD. Over time, but again, uh, so so one of the uh, you know certainly one of the forthcoming reports which could uh, uh, provide at least a little bit of clarity on that for the market will be the next jobs report, specifically the, the uh, non-farm payrolls report due out this Friday at uh, 8:30 New York time. And so looking at the euro here, the euro at 32.90, 1.3290 on the euro. Again, just whipsaw type price, not not terribly whipsaw. I've seen much worse following a Fed decision, but. Uh, Bottom line is a dollar, at least against the euro, virtually unchanged at the moment. I'm just skimming the rest of the uh, Fed statement to see what else. So uh, I think if there's, if there's anything significant beyond the inflation reference we mentioned earlier, if there's anything, if there's anything significant enough from the Fed statement to really grab the market's attention and really take the, the dollar in some direction, uh, it's likely it would have happened by now. I mean, we're, we're 10 minutes removed now from the, uh, the statement's release. And I don't have any uh, stats available to me on this, but my, uh, my, my perception, my intuition tells me that by now, if something would have happened, it was, you know, if there would have been a, a, a big move uh, that would have materialized on the dollar, it would have happened by now. Now, it's not certainly not impossible for the, for the dollar to... Um, to get going here, either in terms of strength or weakness, but uh, as time goes on and, and the dollars, the moment is stalled. As time, the longer time goes on, the uh, and the dollar remains sort of uh, stuck here, where it's at against other major currencies. The longer the dollar remains stuck, the, the more less likely it will uh, really do anything, at least do anything meaningful. I'm going to skim through the rest of the Fed statement now. 
Looking for any uh, differences, especially from the last statement. Nothing jumping out to me right now. There was one dissenter on the in the Fed vote. One person out of the twelve voters that uh, voted against uh, keeping things as they were. Specifically, it was Esther George. Esther George voted against the action. Looks like Esther wanted to um, scale back QE now. Thirty, uh, just saw, just south of thirty-two uh, eighty on the euro now. I could go back to five-minute chart. Can't say that really matters either way. <laughs> Again, the dollar says uh, it's hanging on. But if you look at a, a chart like the euro here, I've got a five-minute chart for the euro USD. I don't know about you, but I I, I find it difficult to justify buying the dollar here against the euro or specifically shorten the euro here. I'll tell you why. Again, this is a five-minute chart. You could you could just you make a case for a line about right there. I've got a, I just added on this separate line. Let me drop this other line first. I just added a line at about thirty two seventy five. You see why I added that? I'm afraid to chart for a moment. You got highs there and here, pre news low there. So you know this this area has been an issue. So this, this could viably be support, and you know, trading one on ones. You, know, you don't you don't sell at support per se until the support's been broken. So you know, other than that, the brief venture up near thirty three thirty five, immediately post news. But you know, it's not surprising you see a, a, a sort of knee jerk reaction news. Other than that, you know, we've sort of been stuck in here. Boy, and even if we dip a little further, I'm looking at an hourly chart now, and you can see the uh, some of the price action. Really, some of those price action this far this week. Look at it, just real mess here. Lows there, highs here. I mean, you can make a case for like 33, 3260 and 3270. Just been a been a, a real issue either way, both as support or as resistance. So, you know, given that we're amongst this muck right now, and you, I think you safely call it muck, given that we're back amongst this muck that, that, that has pretty much defined the euro's price action this week, it's, uh, you know, I find it difficult to do anything with this pair right now. Anything. Now, anyone who had the guts for whatever reason to um, bet against the initial post news moves, congrats. It was, uh, as always, a risky trade for the reasons I discussed earlier. Potential for whipsaw type price action. And uh, for those who don't recall, last month um, it was a, uh, a rather big unidirectional move. I can show you that on the euro, for example. It's on a four hour chart. Where is it? Mm, I think it was here. Where was it? Oh, I know what it was. It was um, it was Bernanke's speech earlier this month. There's a reaction to Bernanke's speech earlier this month, and it was just one way, no looking back. Dollar got punished that day. I'm looking at the chat now, see if there's anything I might have missed. 
Yeah, I see Jeff's comment about taking 20 steps on, the, on cable and buying lunch. Not a bad idea. We got new 15-minute candles in place right now. And the dollar, if anything, has eked out a very modest gain from its uh, pre-news level, but not much, not much. Yeah, Black Cat mentions the euro and range traders have it. It really is. Um, yeah, we. Uh, the market needs something new to focus on. Uh, the, uh, as I see it, that well, you can you can make some arguments that there's uh, uh, there are things happen, and perhaps even in Europe, the market should focus on. But for whatever reason, it's choosing not to. Yeah, at, at the moment, as I see it, the the, the, the next uh, the next event, or the, maybe put it, put it another way. The big question mark for the right market right now. I mean, remember there was like uh, the last uh, two years ago or so, maybe three years ago. Uh, you can even say as, as, as we've seen it last year, the big you know one of the big questions for the market in recent years has been, you know, does does the euro remain intact? Does the uh, uh, does the eurozone remain in its present form, or does someone like you know Greece or another country leave? And um, you know, drop the euro. That was a big question mark. So that that affected uh, you know, any news out of Europe. Any any comments by the like of uh, likes of Draghi or even some other uh, European officials, namely uh, Germany's Germany's finance minister Schäuble. Uh, headlines like that really affected the euro. But uh, you know, right or wrong at the moment, the headlines out of Europe. Well, some of the there's not, not a, nearly the kind of headlines we used to see out of Europe, but uh, whatever headlines we do see, whatever economic data we, we do see out of Europe, it's, it's it's not really affecting Europe's single currency much, not affecting the euro USD much. Uh, the, at the moment, as I see it, the, the one thing that's um, uh, that markets uh, paying the most attention to in terms of the major developed economies, it's uh, the Fed and, and the prospect of the Fed scaling back its uh, its bond buying program. The Fed, the prospect of the Fed uh, tapering. So the, the the question du jour, the question of probably the quarter, the question maybe for the rest of the year is going to be uh, to taper or not to taper, to, to taper or not to taper. That's the question. Now, uh, what I would add though that one, uh, I, I'm showing the chart here. One uh, one theme that has been persistent pretty much all year to date, and I'm showing a daily chart now. And that has been selling of the offering. The Australian dollar has consistently been punished this year. Or really ever since uh, what earlier mid April. And we just made new uh, what is it, three year lows today on the Yossi. Yeah, Jeff says the RBA has been soft, and you know, until the RBA uh, uh, shows some signs that it's going to um, uh, stop being soft, that it's going to uh, uh, turn less uh, less dovish, then that uh, that Aussie could continue. Because remember, remember the, what the Aussie has enjoyed for some time. Well, enjoyed as I as yet relatively. Uh, uh, plenty of companies in Australia have not enjoyed the, uh, the strong Australian dollar, but uh, uh, the RBA has been uh, um, uh, made. Multiple references over multiple really months and years to the strong Australian dollar. That's it's been a that's been a known. But you know, one of the things that's held up the Australian dollar against other currencies like the U.S. dollar, one thing that's held up the Australian dollar has been interest rate differentials. Well, of course, you know the the Chinese growth, the growth of China, and you know China being a big buyer of the commodities from Australia is a, certainly a factor too. But um, uh, you know, interest rate differentials have been a Certainly, have uh, always been a, a key driver of the currency market, and the idea that the, the uh, while other major central banks were keeping rates low or pursuing quantitative quantitative easing programs, while all that's happening, the the uh, by contrast, the Australian central bank until recently has kept rates as is, you know, what three over three percent, but uh, no more. The, uh, the Australian central bank has. Uh, Resume another uh, rate cutting cycle. Now the question is, uh, you know, when will they um, uh, when will they stop cutting rates? Notice uh, the euro perking up again. Let's get back to a short term chart on uh, on the Aussie here. Oh, 
Oh, I should add that there's uh, there uh, following some Fed meetings, following some Fed, Fed statements. There's going to be there is a uh, a press conference where Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke addresses the the media at the, I believe it's the Fed Fed's headquarters and discusses the decision, answers questions, yada yada yada. No Fed, um, uh, no no press conference today. No press conference today. Now there will be a press conference following the next uh, Fed uh, decision. With, with, I, I don't have the date in front of me. It's sometime in um, sometime in September. Fed and uh, next Fed meeting in, in like early uh, early to mid September, and there will be a, a press conference. Then that's one reason why the market, uh, many market players perceive it that the, if the if and when the Fed's going to uh, deliver a tapering decision. Uh, before the end of the year, that would be a likely to uh, meeting at which to do so because, uh, you know, then Bernanke, Fed Chairman Bernanke, could um, explain the Fed's decision in the press conference following the the Fed statement released um, on that day, whatever that uh, Fed decision day is. And plus, you know, it gives uh, between now and then we're going to get more economic data, which will either help bolster the, ca- the Fed's case for for tapering its bond buying program or or not. And here we are on the euro. <laughs> you know, uh, doing a lot of nothing, really. Now, yeah, it's gone up, it's gone down, but again, we're, we're really unchanged. We're really unchanged in the 20 minutes since the news. And again, without any, uh, um, Fed, uh, um, press conference, there's, uh, I don't, don't see how it's reasonable to expect, uh, much anything. Yeah, I mean, could, could the, the dollar, uh, retreat again and the, the, uh, the euro see its, um, uh, posting these highs again, yeah, it's very possible, but it's also po- very possible that that the uh, the dollar just could have uh, waffling here, and then we, we simply we could end up like straddling one point thirty three for the next hour or so. Hello, Jesse. Catching up on some comments on the uh, in the chat room here. I was thinking August. Hey, Bob, I'm not sure what you're referring to about economists thinking August. I'm not. I'm not um, trying to pick a fight or an argument here. I'm just not sure what you're referring. Oh, a rake. Oh, okay, Aussie rake. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm with you there. Yeah, yeah. Black cats just watch out for profit taking on the Aussie. That's a very good point. You're approaching one thirty three again. Yeah, Jimmy, tough price action to trade here, folks. Tough trading without um uh, there's just, you know, we saw some initial dollar weakness, which I'm highlighting now against the British pound. They see a spike. This is a five minute chart for pound dollar currency pair. Dollar has uh, routed a little bit against other currencies, including the British pound. And now here we are back, still back pretty close to where we're pre news. We're in a zone on cable right now, which has had some effect on price action in the past. I just drew a horizontal line around 151.90. And of course, we're not too far from one bit to a psychological level. So, boy, boy. I'm going to go to a chart with indicators now on, um, on the euro. Notice we got pivot points in play here. Daily M4 and R2 pivot points, classic resistance pivot points. Weekly R1, you can just make out on the uh, top of my four-hour chart right there. And, of course, psychological level 1.33. Psychological levels on several major currency pairs can uh, serve as either support or resistance. So keep all that in mind. We have... um, uh, really nothing definitive from the Fed 
uh, the reference to inflation, which it wasn't a surprise given the uh, GDP report out later today. And e- e- regardless of the GDP, pro- re- GDP report earlier today, we uh, uh, bear in mind what I mentioned earlier, which is that um, uh, given uh, given the, uh, the, the nature of the Fed meeting in, in September, we're looking at uh, um, more economic data in, 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 in place by then, so, so the Fed can make a more definitive decision. Also, uh, that that Fed decision in September will be followed by a press conference, which which, which give Ben, ben Bernanke. Uh, more time and more ability to uh, explain the Fed's decision if the Fed makes a tapering decision then. So uh, that's one. Of those, those are some of the reasons why the market's uh, looking to the September meeting of the Fed as the one where if they're going to make a tapering decision, they're going to, if they're going to decide to scale back on their bond purchases, it would likely be then. Not impossible for the Fed to scale back before the end of the uh, – even after that, but you know, before the end of the year, but uh, – it's um that it's it's kind of interesting how uh, September has been a very if you look back in the past three or four years uh, September has been a very common time for the Fed to make a, a key decision. Uh, they've introduced at least one, if not two, different quantitative easing programs uh, at their September meeting. Not unusual at all. Anyway, I came back to this uh, a view showing the uh, Euro charts with indicators only to reference the. Uh, Things like the pivot points that could be in play here as well. You know, just a smidge above 133. One thing I would add in addition to what I mentioned earlier about price action, you know, do, do you buy there? Uh, maybe you did. You had a, a daily central pivot point, several movement averages on the hourly chart there. Eh, perhaps, but uh, again, it would not surprise me if we just straddle one, the 133 area. And the market just goes flat as the uh, all the exuberance from the uh, all the post-Fed decision exuberance sort of washes away here. You take a look around the world. Go back to my view of the uh, USD pairs. Dollar yen's an interesting one, if only because uh, I, I, ex- I expect a little more. Out of the yen, following the elections in Japan, now we did we did get some uh, some yen weakness, probably accompanied by a little bit of dollar weakness. Oh, I'm sorry, we've got some yen strength accompanied by a little bit of yen weakness. I discussed the webinar he did here last Thursday. This trap. This is a dollar yen daily chart. I discussed this trap and the idea that uh, you could wait for the dollar yen to break out of that triangle before you pick a direction, you pick a bias, and well, we got a break to the downside, although. Uh, you know, you could argue we still haven't made a, any definitive direction. We certainly haven't had much happen yet this week. I'm highlighting that small range of trading ranges pair has established thus far this week. But we have broken out of that, uh, that triangle. As I said last week, though, as I said last Thursday, uh, last Thursday I, uh, um, any uh, further retracement down we get could be uh, likely temporary because the you could argue, rightfully so, the longer-term trend for this dollar yen is still up. And what could happen over the coming weeks and months is that the dollar yen, uh, until we get some uh, new commentary out of the Bank of Japan, until we get uh, perhaps a new policy or two or four out of uh, um, Japan's uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, what can move the dollar yen uh, more in the, in the coming weeks and months could be the, 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 Fed's, uh, the Fed's outlook, the Fed's decision, the, the, again, the probability of whether or not the Fed will taper. Oh, by the way, uh, I did um, did show in my last webinar last Thursday some um, some daily range data. Did anyone not see that? Given the uh, sort of ho hum price action we're getting right now, this, that would be a good topic for discussion as we uh, wind down this webinar. Let me see if I could find that. By the way, I tr- um FX3, how much time do I have left? I just want to be sensitive to everyone's time here. Was this a one-hour webinar or, or what? 45 minutes, one hour? Well, the question is, can an hour and 15 minutes really? <laughs> God. If I have to go until... 3 p.m. I'm going to be juggling casting chainsaws and 
might get uh might get ugly. Oh, believe me, folks, I can uh, I can always find something to talk about. So no worries, no worries. And that includes, by the way, anyone who has any questions, because by the way, this is my very last webinar on FX Street, so it will last one for the indefinite future. So if anyone's uh, been sitting on a question they've been dying to ask me for some reason, this is the time. This is the time to do it. Let me grab the uh, the chart that I showed at last Thursday's webinar. Yeah, it's coming, and there it is. Now, this data, the data I'm showing this chart uh, applies through last Tuesday, last Wednesday. Get my dates right here. Last Tuesday, actually. Last Tuesday was July 23rd. Here's what I did. And I, by the way, if uh, even if you saw, if you, even if you were at the webinar last Thursday and uh, heard me discuss this, and yeah, it'll be a little bit of repetition for you if you, if you saw this last Thursday or heard me discuss this last Thursday. But yeah, remember, repetition is the mother of learning, and perhaps you missed you miss a thing or two. Uh, what I show here are uh, 20-day moving averages of daily ranges for each of four uh, different currency, major currency pairs. So, for example, again, this was as of last Tuesday, as of last two, well, actually, specifically as of last Wednesday, because uh, I showed the, uh, and let's, let's just make it Tuesday for simplicity's sake. So I'm going to look at the dollar yen, for example. Notice how... Right there is the, my, the most recent data point on this chart for the dollar yen. The dollar yen uh, moving average for, for daily range represented by the red line in this chart. There's the red line for the dollar yen. So what does this point represent? Well, first of all, that point's about uh, 100 and, almost 110, just shy of 110 pips per day. So what does that mean? Well, as of last Tuesday, as of last Tuesday, High minus low, so you get you take the high price, you get the low price for each of those 20 days. You get a range in pips, so you have 20 numbers each in pips representing 20 days in the range for each day. You take the swing figures, you calculate an average, and you get uh, the figure, which again in the case of last Tuesday was about uh, 100, nearly 110 pips. So you get a snapshot of last of the last Tuesday was about 110 pips. Now back in um, Back in mid July or so, was uh, closer to 15 pips. So we've come a long way on dollar yen. Now, dollar yen also isn't anywhere near what it was earlier this year. We topped out at 180 pips per day on average for dollar yen earlier this year. We're not anywhere near that now, but however, dollar yen still is moving some and certainly showing more volatility than it showed before. Uh, Shinzo Abe made those in, uh, famous comments back in uh, mid-November in a debate with uh, the, the other prime minister at the time, which uh, sparked the, the speculation about uh, aggressive uh, uh, quantitative easing by the Bank of Japan, which the Bank of Japan eventually did fall through on. So what I had, what I discussed last Thursday was uh, not only the um, um, the drop in the relative drop in volatility on a pair like the dollar yen, but you know, even some of the other pairs have dropped in volatility. Now, I do recall some six years ago, your USD before the US, before the U.S. subprime mortgage crisis, your USD was moving something like I don't know 60 pips per day. So, although the euro could be a a, 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 a source of frustration for many traders, at nearly 100 pips per day, it's still moving fairly well con- compared to what it's done in the past. Again, I. I still remember the day the euro would barely move 60 pips per day, and yet we would still find ways to make money on that. So while the euro is maybe not moving to your liking, it's, it's, we're still getting some decent volatility. Now, uh, the, the terms of trends in volatility, I already mentioned the uh, uh, declining uh, uh, volatility on the dollar yen, although dollar yen is still moving uh, better than it was at this, at this time last year. Uh, there are other trends of volatility that are worth noting. For example, um, the Aussie. We know that Aussie's been trending this year, specifically since what early to mid uh, April, uh, as we just, as I discussed earlier. The Aussie's been trending down. And of course, with trends, often come greater volatility, and you can see that. Let me re- let me reset this uh, marker on this graphic. 
So here, th this represents the uh, moving average for daily range for the OS, and you can see the move. And let me let me change the color of that marker. And you can see how the uh, the volatility in the Aussie has increased over time. Now it's diminished a bit of late, but uh, definitely uh, the, the Aussies have definitely been a mover of late, a, a trender specifically. And you can see that re reflected in the uh, uh, increase in volatility. In fact, look, you know, for the uh, if you look over the past year, the Aussie hasn't shown you a whole lot in volatility between 60 and 100 pips per day for much of the last year, much of the last year. Well, that changed to enable, as I mentioned earlier. Volatility's increased. Now it's it's down a bit a bit lately, but you know probably down a bit lately only only because of the so-called summer doldrums. Uh, volatility in the, in the foreign exchange market, barring any you know major fundamental events, volatility does tend to decline a bit during this uh, time of year. You know, especially July, maybe even parts of August as well, because since all nearly all the Europeans are a bit on vacation at uh, at this time. But one trend that does um that does strike me a bit, and it's uh, on this on this graphic is uh, the pound, pair otherwise known as cable. That is the blue line. Look at the blue line on this graphic. Let me change the color of this. So I'm highlighting in light blue the trend in volatility, that is 20-day movement average of daily range on the pair known as cable. Gotta wonder if that's headed up further. Now again, we're down a bit of late. As again, this was through last, uh, or mid last week. But again, a lot of pairs were down of late, uh, through last week because of the, probably good, just again, just because of the natural overall market declining volatility. But, uh, the point I want to emphasize, besides with the, with the magenta colored marker, is, uh, of, of these four major currency pairs, the one pair that has held up in terms of volatility over the past month or two is really cable. Right in here. Kind of interesting when you consider that, uh, uh, former Bank of England Governor Mervyn King left that central bank and now, uh, Mark Carney from the, from the Bank of Canada has taken over there. So is the market, uh, uh, going to start paying more attention to cable? Perhaps, uh, Mark anticipating some, uh, new policy moves by that central bank with, uh, new ownership in place. Well, I said by ownership, I mean the new, new, new governor in place. That's a possibility. Now, in, you know, in terms of any trend on cable, that may not really materialize until, um, uh, maybe not even next month. Maybe it's going to be September before that materializes. Now, keep in mind on cable though, uh, not only what the Bank of England is doing, but, you know, certainly what the, the Fed is expected to do or, or what the market anticipates the Fed might do. It could be interesting because, uh, you know, what if, um, if, if you think about the what if scenarios, right now that the right or wrong, the, the market perceives the Fed's going to, uh, eventually taper, you now, you know, compare that to what the market thinks the, uh, uh, the Bank of England's going to do. If we have a situation where the, uh, the, the Fed's expected to taper, and yet uh, you know, does the Bank of England uh, uh, stamp pat or even uh, do some of its own, uh, or suggest some of its own version of tapering? That can make for some tough trading. Remember what you like, what you like when it comes to the, well, uh, let's be back up there. What, um, what a lot of traders like, what a lot of traders like to see is a trend, a trend driven by things like, you know, shifting interest rate differentials, which in turn are driven by changes in the monetary policy. So, uh, uh, well, let's put it let's put it even more simply. Markets tend to like it when one central bank is doing one thing and another central bank is either doing nothing or the complete opposite. That you know, that's the that, that's the stuff trends are made of, and that's the stuff that uh, you know, good weeks, months, and, and years are made of when, it, when it, whether you're a trader or a hedge fund. So that's uh, keep that in mind when it comes to not just the Fed versus the the, the um, the Bank of England, but also the you know the Fed versus the uh, European Central Bank. Uh, remember, remember what the ECB did there recently? They just uh, issued their own uh, uh, forward guidance. Something new for the ECB hasn't happened yet, but it's something worth watching. And that is, um, if by the way, the euro back near its uh, post news highs, 
if the Fed does in some way, shape, or form in, in the coming months, maybe it's, maybe it's going to be at the September meeting, if the Fed does, in fact, um, decide to uh, incorporate some sort of tapering measure, you know, scaling back its bond purchases, not buying as, as much, whereas if uh, the European Central Bank, by contrast, uh, actually hints at either uh, a forthcoming rate cut or a, a take their deposit rate negative or some sort of dovish move, some sort of sort of a stimulatory move. Uh, that's 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 going to break the euro. It should break the euro, I should say, out of this recent uh, uh, stuck place we're at around uh, 132, 133. Uh, Tim, uh, lengthy, uh, the, resp- the answer to that, by the way, a cable makes man a new post news high. Long answer, Tim. I've been, I guess I've been, I did, I've been doing this a long time. There are, uh, there's an area that, um, that intrigues me right now. An area I'm actually, uh, an industry, um, I guess you'd call it an industry, a sector that, uh, um, I'm actually very well suited for that I've really ignored for like, for like six years. It's called big data. Big data. I'm uh, doing some work in that now, and I'm looking at some uh, other opportunities in that right now. Oh, believe me, Tim, it's not for lack of interest in the markets. It's just that, uh, you know, where's what's going to interest me, and uh, where's... Um, where are my where are my services uh, most in demand? I, I'll tell you this: this whole big data area is uh, there's a whether it's companies, individuals, there's a lot of data being created, and there's just not nearly enough people to make uh, make sense of it or to create tools that make sense of it. So it's a it's an area I've been watching. It's an area I've been watching for a while, and it's, it's, it seems like as good time as any to um, to delve into it. Well, thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that. Aussie almost back at 90. I thought I had another graphic for you guys. I showed you the daily range graphic. I showed you the, uh, of course, the GDP price index. By the way, uh, given the uh, technical issues earlier, my sound was choppy and stuff. Did, did anyone uh, not see the uh, uh, discussion on, on the price indexes? I mean, I'll do a quick summary of this here, and I'll, and I'll, I'll take a closer look at the chat and see if I miss any questions. By the way, if, if you've already posted a question or comment you want me to address and I haven't seen it, please post it again. I could have easily missed it. Oh, well, here's why I, dis- I, I started the uh, webinar uh, discussing this graph, this graphic, and, uh, and you might say this is uh, at least part of the reason why we're we're seeing the dollar re- retain its weakness in spite of the, the sort of the um, the flippy type price action we saw. Um, uh, in the 30 minutes immediately following the Fed decision. What I discussed earlier, in case you missed it, and even if you did catch it, uh, it's a good, good, good review. Look at the direction of uh, this, these inflation measures. Now, what this is, again, if you've missed it, uh, the core PC price index, this specifically is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, it's derived from the uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, 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 GDP report. So we got the U.S. GD- we got the first estimate for U.S. GDP for the second quarter that came out during today's New York morning session. Well, one of the many things that report includes is uh, price indexes, specifically uh, personal consumption expenditure search or PCE. So again, the PC price index, specifically the core PC price index. A preferred measure of inflation for the Federal Reserve. That's one they look at closely and, you know, presumably make their policy decisions based in part on that stuff. So what, what does core PC mean? So personal consumption expenditures, you take out the, uh, the prices related to food and energy, you get what's, what's left is called core PC, or again, core personal consumption expenditures price index. Now it's just you know, in terms of its cal- how it's calculated, it's it's different from CPI. And there's, there's no, I don't know if there's any right or wrong. We, there's been debates for eons now about the validity 
of this measure of inflation the validity of the classic consumer price index. There's not enough time or scope in this webinar for that particular uh, debate or discussion. The point is, is the Fed definitely does pay attention to this index. Now, what has it been doing? What the, what the lines represent, what the lines represent here is the percent change from year to year over a course of one year in the index. So, for example, both the core PCE and the regular PCE and price index have changed barely, barely more than 1% over the past 12 months. Now, that's a, that's far shy of what the Fed's, you know, the Fed's looking for like about 2%, and in fact, they, uh, uh, that's kind of their sweet spot. The Fed's sweet spot around, uh, around 2% inflation has been for some time. And the Fed's, uh, uh specifically in their forward guidance issued, uh, was late, late last year, the Fed's uh, had said that, uh, Two and a half, two and a half percent inflation would, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, two and a half percent inflation would kind of spook the Fed into, um, or as we get, as, as we, as, as market got, as the economy got near two and a half percent inflation, it would give the reason, give the Fed reason to get more hawkish and tighten policy. In other words, to raise rates or certainly to scale back their, uh, uh, their what now four or five year old, uh, quantitative easing program. But again, look at the direction of inflation right now. We're st- we still see rising prices. Again, prices are still rising overall year over year, but not, they're not rising nearly as quickly as they have been in the past. So this this direction of the trend in inflation you see right now, it's called disinflation. Disinflation. So again, it's, prices are still rising, just not as rapidly as they used to be. This re- this trend, if it continues, the disinflation is uh, one that would um, – um, be supportive of the Fed continuing its current uh, uh, quantitative easing program in its present form and not tapering. So uh, the, the forthcoming inflation numbers will, will, should be closely watched. Certainly the uh, uh, the jobs numbers, including the, the NFP report this Friday, should be closely watched. Uh, remember, the Fed's looking at both, not just the inflation numbers, but also the jobs numbers. So. But um, in terms of the, on the inflation front there, we do not have an inflation issue in the U.S., at least, again, according to how this measures inflation. As I said earlier, there's uh, there's been plenty of debates on how inflation is measured, and some would debate, like Peter Schiff, for example, would, would argue that inflation is much higher than, the, the, uh, than what the measures show, and I won't argue with that. But, again, what we're, what we're, what we're, um, what we're talking about here, what we're speculating here is how the Fed will react, how the Fed – it will change policy, and what they do, right or wrong, is based on measures like this. So it's interesting. We have a uh, we have an economy that's you know it's we're producing some jobs in the U.S. Uh, we just saw the ADP report released earlier today. Uh, Two hundred thousand uh, jobs reportedly were produced by the U.S. in uh, a and I almost said April in uh, in July. Bear in mind, though, that, and of course, we'll see the NFP report on Friday, which will give us a, a, a good look at this, but, uh, I, I don't know how much the Fed officials talk about this. I've seen a couple of references, I think, in the past to this, but, uh, uh, as you watch the job reports, not just for NFP, but other reports, which include references to the, to the U.S. jobs picture, as you watch these job reports, uh, you might want to dig into some of the details and look at things like the quality of jobs. Has anyone noticed that? Has, has anyone read anything, or even maybe dug into the numbers yourself and looked at the um, the quality of the jobs that are being produced? Last time I checked, and this was like was about a week ago or so, um, we're still seeing uh, some eh, relatively low paying jobs being produced. Relatively, some would call them low quality jobs produced in the U.S. The strength of recovery could be at least the the strength of the jobs picture would be uh, uh, certainly could be dictated in part by not just the quantity of jobs produced, but also the quality of jobs produced. I mean, it's it's one thing if uh, it'd be one thing to get three hundred thousand jobs when uh, if you know if the bulk of those were relatively low skilled, low paying jobs. Another thing is to get three hundred thousand jobs per month on average. If a greater proportion of those were higher skilled jobs, like you know, like uh, information technology or programming type jobs, like accounting, like engineering. We're not seeing that right now, folks. We're not seeing that, at least not in the U.S., not at the moment.
You are trying to make a new post new saw. I hasn't done it yet. Yeah, we're nearing that weekly R1 that we mentioned earlier. <laughs> Look at that daily chart for cable here. So I, I mentioned cable earlier, and I mentioned the uh, uh, arrival of uh, Mark Carney as the new governor of the Bank of England. Not the uh, not the easiest of uh, pairs to um, uh, decipher now in terms of a medium to longer term direction, but uh, I, I still say a pair to keep an eye on, if only because the uh, of the of the for now of the rising trend and volatility on the pair. Uh, definitely keep an eye on the. Uh, what's the next Bank of England? Is it? Uh, I feel like it's next week, but I could be wrong about that. Admittedly, I should know, and I don't. I thought their meeting was next week. I'm referring to the Bank of England. Looking at a counter now. Oh, that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yes, yeah, the Bank of England uh, decision to do out tomorrow. Same for the ECB. Definitely keeping a close eye on those. So I'm sure, I believe that there's going to be webinars. Uh, at least I know of a webinar covering the ECB event. Here at FX Street. I have a private question about the ADP report and its relation to NFP. Uh, I wish I could tell you that ADP was a decent predictor of NFP. It just isn't. Uh, I, I wouldn't say there's no correlation, but the correlation is, is weak to maybe moderate at best at times. But there's just, over time, there's been, uh, there's been plenty of noise in the ADP numbers relative to what the NFP numbers provide. So, I, you know, I just, I, I wouldn't assume anything. Well, yeah, I just, yeah, I just wouldn't assume anything when it comes to what NFP says versus what, uh, I'm sorry, what ADP says versus what NFP will say. Perhaps the better indicators, if, uh, uh, the, maybe one of the better guys to look at, it's, it's a, even it's a weak one as well, but, uh, you might look at the, um, uh, employment sub index from tomorrow's ISM manufacturing report. If you see a, a notable uh, move either up or down in that index, that could be a precursor to uh, what NFP brings. I mean, even that one's not perfect, but uh, it's something, something to look at. You know, you have to make a new post, new high. Trying to, though. Oh, she's still just shy of 9,000. Hey, cheers, Stephen. I'm actually looking at an analysis of the uh, of the current or what was released about an hour ago, the current FOMC statement versus the one issued in June. See if there's any noticeable differences there. They did reference a, in their late, most recent statement. They did, they did have referenced a, a rise in mortgage rates, which you know certainly is not good news for the. Uh, U.S. housing sector. The reference to U.S. economic growth in the, in the latest statement, uh, maybe a, just a touch more upbeat. Last month they said economic growth will proceed at a moderate pace. Uh, in the statement issued about an hour ago, they said economic growth will pick up from its recent pace. So maybe a little upbeat there, but you know the dollar is certainly not reflecting that. But, you know, bear in mind how markets uh, tend to work. And, uh, I mean, not always, but often enough, the market will pick, you know, one thing to focus on and move according to that. Now, does that, again, does that explain this, this move uh, we're getting right now? I don't know. But, uh, uh, to, to me, one of the more uh, notable takeaways from this FOMC statement issued about an hour ago was the reference to inflation. 
and the and the actually the, again the, the risk that inflation will remain will remain persistently below the Fed's two percent objective. And there's a I believe we're just getting a, a new post news high on the uh, euro there. Could be interesting to see how the uh, market reacts or not to um, this Fed decision come uh, London Open. Well, what, it's 12 hours from now. Sometimes you get some fall through then. Not the most uh, uh, dramatic of decisions, though, certainly. And as we discussed earlier, the uh, this... Uh, to me, this put, at least in the near medium to medium term, this puts the focus on the uh, the forthcoming U.S. economic data. Of course, the NFP report on Friday. You know, don't ignore the uh, as I mentioned a moment ago. Don't ignore the uh, uh, ISM manufacturing report due out during tomorrow's New York morning session. But of course, NFP on Friday, inflation numbers and more jobs numbers next month. Oh, by the way, typically uh, um, there is a uh, a a Bernanke speech at the Jackson Hole Symposium in near the end of uh, August. But unless that's something changed, last I heard, last I checked, uh, Bernanke's not going to be not going to be there. He's a, a, he has a schedule conflict, which I find very interesting. When you're the, when you're the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and, and, and for years the Fed chairman has, has delivered a, the keynote speech at the Jackson Hole Symposium for for central bankers. What kind of uh, what kind of conflict would prevent you from going there? I don't, I don't think Bernanke's got a golf date or anything like that. I don't know what I haven't even haven't even heard what the conflict is. But uh, last I heard that Bernanke's not going to be uh, doing the uh, traditional Jackson Hole speech. I think one of you mentioned uh, yields. I haven't even looked at the ten year myself. So post. Uh, Post FOMC. <clears throat> 260. Well, I'm at 261. I think that was north of a 270. I'm talking about the U.S. 10 year government bond yield, the U.S. 10 year treasury yield. That was something like north of 2 or right around 2.7, 2.7% earlier today. It's now down 2.60. So, uh, uh, and that kind of makes some sense. Perhaps the bond market reacting a bit to that, uh, the Fed's uh, reference to um, uh, the risk of inflation remaining persistently below 2%. So 2.71 was the high. Well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is the uh, the time when this, this this is the time when the bell is supposed to ring here. My uh, the end of my uh, scheduled webinar time. So. Uh, even if it isn't, uh, it, sh it should be close. So um, uh, I want again. I want to thank everyone for attending. I want to thank especially FX Street for making all the, not just this event, for all these events possible. Thank you, thank you, FX Street for continuing to invite me back. And uh, hey, what can I say? It's been it's been real. It's been fun. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Anyone uh, care to contact me fo uh, following this for any reason? You may you may feel free to do so. There's my email address, kurt.worley at gmail.com. Take care, folks. Good luck with your future trading. Cheers.